in Guatemala. He was reunited with his father, who was living with his new girlfriend, Gladys. When Sam's father was working long hours as a construction worker, Gladys began to keep Sam in school and instead made him work for her in homes and offices, forcing him to scrub toilets with his bare hands. She would never physically hurt him in fear that Sam's dad would uh, find out that she would starve him if he acted up. One day, Gladys left Sam alone while she went out with her friends. A neighbor heard crying and called the police, and they found Sam leashed in the backyard and warned she eating food out of a dirty bucket. Child Protective Services placed Sam into a foster home until the court decided it was safe to reunite Sam and his dad. So, when you think of human trafficking, is this case of Sam uh, normally the first kind of case that you think of? Who here has heard of human trafficking before the news? Uh, okay, so lots of hands. Uh, when you hear human trafficking in the news, what do you typically think of? Just, just want to shout it out. What do you see? What do you say? Movie Taken. What else? Sex trafficking. Prostitution. Prostitution. So really, largely centered around sex trafficking, right? A uh, story of a young boy who's nine years old being forced by someone he knows, really his father's girlfriend, to clean houses. Um, it's not really the case that always catches your attention in the media. So already from the get-go, we're thinking hmm, there's a lot more human trafficking than what we're just hearing in the news, or uh, what we're seeing in the movie taken. And um, in this particular scenario, it's a neighbor who helps stand out. It's not Liam Neeson, um, although I'm sure that would be an interesting scenario. So let's talk, talk a bit about what trafficking is. So today, our objectives are to look at the direct services in the Bay Area and kind of bump up here as well because we do serve this county and have cases from Sonoma. Understand why and how people are trafficked and what are the laws about it and protecting and empowering our clients. What are the social and legal services that are available for trafficking survivors and what can we do? So we hear about trafficking in you, we hear it's an awful terrible thing. What is our role in this fight? Uh, my agency, just to give you a bit of background of where we come from, is called Asian Pacific Island <coughs> Legal Outreach. It is kind of a mouthful. We were founded in 1975 in San Francisco, and we have one office in Oakland as well. We have a community-based social justice organization. When you say community-based, you will see from this presentation that most of our work talks about working together with our communities. What does it mean to empower ourselves within, to change our ideas within, rather than kind of dropping out of the sky into a community saying, Hey, I've got an idea, this is what you need to do, this is how you should change things. It's a very different approach to uh, working on social justice issues. We do provide direct legal services. Most of us at our agency are attorneys. And, um, we, um, in addition to our anti-trafficking project, we also do do immigration work. And a lot of our work is really centered around domestic violence and family law issues and other social justice issues. And you will see that this has really informed and shaped the way that we approach our trafficking. The anti-trafficking collaborative of the Bay Area is comprised of several agencies. It's our agency, uh, NARICA, an Asian Women Shelter, Mujeres Unidas, the FUS, and the Sage Shelter. And what it means to purge is that we are community-based, we're all community-based organizations uh, who seek to provide comprehensive social and legal services together for trafficking survivors. Okay, so I'm a lawyer. So we can go to court, we can get documents for someone, we can do certain legal things. But at the end of the day, the first question often is the topic is where I come to us is, where am I going to sleep tonight? Or I left the situation with nothing but the clothes on my back, or maybe a few of my possessions in a garbage sack. Uh, or maybe I have a child with me and I have no idea how I'm going to provide the right kind of nutrition for my child tomorrow. So a lot of these questions uh, are just as important as the legal, the pressing legal questions that we do. Uh, we have been involved in some of the major cases. Uh, this is just a small sample of them that you might have heard of here in the Bay Area, starting all the way back in 1989 with the Lucky Ready Ready case um, involving a Berkeley restaurant uh, in East Bay. Uh, the large case Operation Build a Cage involving over 120 something, mostly Korean women in massage parlors, um, but also in various forms of cases involving domestic servants. Our mission, I mentioned earlier, is to provide victim-centered, comprehensive services and to really think about what does it mean to empower someone from a victim becoming a survivor. 
When you are a victim, oftentimes we're meeting people at some of the very lowest points of their life or a point where they're in a bad state. That is not something that necessarily defines their kind of person. So what does it mean to empower them to be survivors, to make this positive transition? And to offer linguistic and culturally appropriate services. I think a lot of people think that the uh, easy way to work with immigrants or those from other backgrounds is, OK, I'll just find someone, I'll just find an immigrant and that will solve the problem. But often in the trafficking cases, you see there are a lot of nuances that require this cultural understanding. Um, actually, oftentimes, many of the domestic violence survivors we work with and trafficking survivors, their number one concern when they go to shelters um, tend to be about issues like, am I going to eat food that I used to? Um, maybe I'm cheese, <coughs> maybe I'm lactose intolerant, and most of the food at the shelters don't suit my taste. So things like that are important to people's recovery. Let's talk about the other terms that are used in the media on a constant basis. Um, the most popular terms tend to be about rescue. Someone rescued someone, taking someone who's doing these things, rescuing his daughter. There was a lot of rescue. Um, but again, I think our question as service provider is not so much rescue, but what does it mean to restore someone's dignity? How do we reframe work the work that we do from rescue? We talk about restoring dignity and rights for someone. That is a very different kind of conversation. It's not a surprise that people who lack access to their rights, especially in other countries, are those who tend to be most vulnerable to exploitation and trafficking. Um, trafficking is a violation of human rights. It's not necessarily just a moral problem. Someone decided one day that they were going to be bad towards someone else. There are a lot of complicated factors that we'll go into about how someone is trafficked and the motivation behind trafficking. Receiving countries of the labor, so the United States, as we're receiving migrants coming here to work, we're responsible for protecting people who enter our country, regardless of the way that they enter. And also the countries in which people are migrating from also have a responsibility to protect uh, their citizens um, from the dangerous class of what's driving this migration path. We'll talk about that. <coughs> so who exactly is trafficked? There's a lot of different statistics out there. It's hard, honestly, at the end of the day to really know who is trafficked when the question is that you're trying to count a population that's inherently invisible behind the scenes, right? It's very difficult to ask them, hey, um, if you are trafficked and you're not free, can you go ahead and raise your hand so we can count you? <laughs> it's very difficult. That being said, uh, some of the ideas, this is, this is a uh, statistic from the International Labor Organization, that they estimate that there's anywhere on account of 21 million people World who are in some form of unfree labor. 21 million people. Uh, that is just a staggering number. Of which most of it, 68%, is forced labor exploitation. Uh, and that's because, we'll get into this, um, trafficking in forms of unfree labor. If you think about labor, it's really just a very, very broad category that's almost everything, excluding maybe the way that they carve out commercial sexual exploitation in the United States, imposed forms of forced labor. So trafficking is also a local problem. Um, in that earlier slide, I listed all those cases. Most of those cases happen from the Bay Area or here in California. We are a top destination for our trafficking survivors. Not only do we have a large and diverse immigrant population, um, we have a large foster care population. We um, have many different ports of entry. We have uh, Mexico. We have many airports, et cetera, et cetera. Let's talk about who is traffic. And this is just a simple client snapshot from our collaborative alone. Um, our clients are not only just female, but as you saw earlier in Sam's story, male. We also have transgender clients. That's a population that I don't want us to forget. Um, the age range is 9 to 75. Often we hear about child trafficking, but um, actually I've had several cases involving elders. Why? Because elders also, seniors, become very vulnerable, maybe in a different kind of way. And the abuse also starts to look different. It's about, it can be about neglect, it can be about threats of homelessness, and um, elders can sometimes also be trafficked by their family members and children. Several countries of origin, um, they really span the world. This is just a small token example. And as you can see, the United States is also listed here. Why? Because trafficking doesn't know boundaries. Um, it's a lot like domestic violence in that sense. And you don't need to be an immigrant or undocumented to be trafficked. 
Catholic people are um, sometimes undocumented. They're sometimes U.S. citizens. They're sometimes legal permanent residents. Uh, it's not reliant on status, but sometimes the status can be a complicating factor of uh, what keeps someone a fraud in the situation. But nonetheless, it's not related to what kind of pure fraud. It's not an either or situation. And the types of trafficking, labor, sex, combinations of whatever the case. This is also just a sample of Bay Area of trafficking industry. It's a very small sample, but already a huge list, right? And when we have a domestic servitude, we see many of this case, these cases where someone is usually sometimes a nanny or someone who's doing housekeeping type of work. Um, we've had several cases involving people who've had to do domestic work for consular officials and diplomats. Uh, who here has heard of the recent case in New York involving the Indian official? It is in the news, so it happened probably around December of the break. Uh, it caused a huge stir across the nation, so go ahead and be interested. Agricultural labor. This is particularly true as we start to go into populations um, where there's, it's more rural, it's more agricultural based, particularly, for example, this county, and going the other direction. Um, different forms of sex work, so this can be in sexualized industries or different forms such as underground brothels and <coughs> parlors. Restaurant work, so around marriage, this is an interesting thing because uh, we do see cases where usually young women are brought over from certain countries. Sometimes they're very young, anywhere between 14 to 15, 16, sometimes older. And they're not just brought to be wives, but they are brought to be basically servants to the household, and not just to the husband, but to extended families as well. So those are cases where we see a mixture of domestic violence and trafficking together. Criminal activity. Uh, this industry has exploded quite a bit. We've seen quite a number of these cases where many people, usually youth from Central America and Mexico, are being brought here to be drug mules. Um, enforced by the cartels to do this kind of work. These cases are very difficult because oftentimes when uh, they're caught, they are prosecuted or arrested instead, and these and, and the youth tend to be very terrified to say anything to law enforcement because they've been told by the drug cartels that they are in, they have insiders within law enforcement or law control, uh, or that they'll find them and kill them, or they'll find them and kill their family members. And the drug cartels doing any business, they're very, very violent. So we have seen a lot of those cases in um, and so on and so forth. Um, fishing, we have the fishing cases as well. Something that people don't always hear about, but it's actually quite uh, prevalent also in Southeast Asia as well. Who are the traffickers? We have a sense a little bit of the population of who is being trafficked. So who are the traffickers? Traffickers, just like the trafficking victims in some sense, really can be any. We have cases involving like I said earlier, diplomats, police officers, um, teachers, other people who are undocumented. Um, but they're often, they tend to be members of the uh, ethnic or national community, or maybe they grew up next door to this person. They are related through them, sometimes through media or external extended familial ties. Um, so like in Sam's case, Gladys, in some sense, is somewhat related, or at least is a girlfriend of Sam's father. Um, and they are often fluent in English. I mean, they really know what to say to someone to get them to come here, right? Or to, to do something. They know how to usually speak their language, what makes a certain community tick, what's appealing to people. And so that is something that we see quite frequently. Other kinds of traffickers, I mentioned other, uh, for example, the drug cartels, there's international one as criminal syndicates. Uh, the operation of the UK, just one example. They're usually Asian syndicates. Um, I've done cases before. <coughs> So it does exist, but it's not the basis of every single kind of trafficking case. Um, also, large third party labor recruiters who work a lot of over recruit that is on temporary guest worker visas to come to the United States. We see a lot of these cases as well. Okay. Sometimes it's mom and pop family operations, so the person who's working in the local restaurant or the local underground brothel, um, and it can be independently owned businesses as well. <coughs> So let's talk a bit about what causes trafficking. And um, there's not a perfect answer to this because the breadth and depth of type of profile trafficking case uh, varies so much. But typically, a lot of what drives people uh, and through some of these root causes of some of these issues tend to be issues of poverty, inequality, um, gender discrimination, uh, gender inequality abroad, 
So for example, I have a client who was being severely abused by her husband, and she really thought that um, he was going to kill her. And she would call the police, and they would say, this is not our problem, this is your personal affair. And so when she was offered the job to come work in the United States to do sex work, she thought, if I don't take this opportunity, my husband is going to kill me. And I calculate, based off of what I've been told, that I can come to the United States and do the sex work for maybe, you know, three months, four months, and I can pay off the debt that it requires for me to get here, and then I can be free of him and maybe I'll survive this. Um, unfortunately, when she came, it turns out the terms and conditions changed. So um, even though she knew she was coming to do sex work, she wasn't able to liquidate and pay off the debt. So instead of what was promised that she could end this in three to five months, she was there for um, anywhere close up to over a year. Very, very different, but you can see already how different traumas and problems are driving people to enter risky situations because they feel like they have no choice. Poverty is another big one. I have clients tell me that they come abroad because they felt inadequate as a father because they couldn't even buy their daughter a doll for Christmas. Um, and that they really wanted to be able to support their child to be able to go to college one day. So, finding a lot of these things, um, I have to So, we went over those push and pull factors. Pull factors as well. Sometimes <coughs> it's not always just people escaping a situation, but it could be because their recruitment sounds really appealing. Maybe someone wants to travel and see the world. Maybe they want to get, they were promised that they could get an education. I had someone tell me that the most appealing thing that their traffic told them was that if they came to the United States, they would teach them how to drive. Um, and how many people here drive? Like almost everybody. Right? I mean, being able to drive is a huge part of your mobility. It's part of your ability to go places. You know about a lot of the debate about women being able to drive in some of the Gulf states. So it's not a surprise that that could be something that's really appealing to come from the rest for. Okay. Let's talk a little about the money story. And um, money is a man from Cambodia. He worked overseas through employment agencies to fish in Chinese waters. And through an employment agency, he signed a two-year contract to fish in the boat named Ocean Song for tuna in Hawaiian waters. He was flown to American Samoa where he boarded Ocean Song. And in the middle of the ocean, Ocean's, uh, Ocean Song transferred him forcibly to work on another boat altogether named Sea Jewel, which was not the boat that he had the contract with. On Sea Jewel, the captain was extremely cruel and would not let um, him sleep for more than three hours a time because when you're fishing, you're constantly getting up, you're pulling in the nets, you're recasting everything again over and over. Um, he converted the ship to fishing for sword fishing sharks instead of tuna. Very different. This is something I don't know about the fishing industry. Um, when you're fishing for sharks and sword fish, you're also in very, very cold waters. You're fishing for large game fish. It's very, very dangerous, very different. Um, he was given torn protective gear and, threatened, and was threatened to throw, uh, be thrown into the ocean all the time. He was paid less than half of what was promised in the original contract. And then if he wanted to go home and break the contract early, that he would owe $5,000 uh, for all the expenses it took to get him onto that ship as captain. He was told that if he got off the ship and he got to San Francisco, that he would be thrown into jail in the port. And it's true, most crewmen, when they come into the different ports without permission, are not allowed to get off the boat. Um, and he, this client did very daringly jump off the boat um, pretty much in the middle of the night and ran to, for safety, but the captain um, did also call the officials on him. We had to negotiate the officials to demonstrate that actually our client had been abused and was convicted of trafficking among other many, many labor exploitation. But what's driving him here is obviously um, a lot of issues related to back in his home country for poverty, needing to support his family, but also a lot of false recruitment issues here. Let's talk a little about, about this term slavery and the legal definitions about where trafficking originates. Uh, how many people here have heard of the term modern day slavery, slavery in relation to trafficking? A lot of people here there. But that's a bit about what people um, are reconceptualizing trafficking as and what is the connection to slavery. Slavery, uh, in the 1926 Convention of the League of Nations, they were defined as the status or condition of a person over whom any or all of the powers attached to the right of ownership are exercised. And freedom from chattel slavery, being able to own someone, was actually one of the first things that the international community could really agree on. Um, that being said, the U.S. we went a little bit behind on the curve, we were just being told this is the of our right to figure these issues out. But on a, on a broad basis level, this is one of the first things the international community 
cohesive. You know what? We know that slavery has been happening for a long time, but this just seems so wrong. This seems like a total violation of someone's rights. Um, and in the U.S., the tradition of slavery down in the South, as we are familiar with in our history, we tend to call antebellum slavery. However, slavery is different from many slave-like practices, and you'll see that trafficking actually recognizes that people can still force other people to work for them without owning them. Um, and they can do this through many different ways, some of them being such as debt bondage. So uh, owing some of the debt that you can't pay down. So um, you know, you add on to the debt. So in some of our massage parlor cases, they'll say, okay, well, uh, now you have to work here and you have to earn certain amount of money before you can go. But by the way, every condom, every birth control that you use for any of your customers is an additional $5. Um, and on top of that, I forgot to tell you that next year you're going to have to pay rent $300 to sleep on this piece of cardboard before. Anything is sort of to keep racking up the debt so that you can't really pay it down. Um, and servitude is a much broader concept than slavery. So when we're talking about trafficking and modern forms of slavery, we're not just talking about ownership, we're talking about what are the different ways that people uh, force people to in different forms of unfree labor. The UN had a Palermo protocol they put out in 2000. It's kind of one of the first ones they really started to think about expressing this in legal terms. It's a lot of text. I'm not going to make you read it out loud. Just write down Palermo protocol if you want to know about it. And um, what you mostly need to know is that this was kind of the backdrop in the two, early 2000s um, into really putting a lot of this trafficking language into the law. And that internationally, one of the main things that's a bit different here in the U.S. is that they also talk about their removal and the sales of organs as a form of trafficking, which is something we don't talk about as much in the U.S., but is indeed something abroad that people are concerned about. So, under the Palermo Protocol and the U.S. Trafficking Victims Protection Act, which is what the TVPA is, they talk about the three P's when they pass it, which is prosecution, uh, protection, and prevention. Uh, and the three P's are very important because oftentimes people think, well, you know, there's a big problem here. There's all these bad things going on. Um, let's just, we need to prosecute her and throw everyone to jail. And I think that this is a much better model because it says, okay, aside from, you know, enforcing the laws, what are the other things that we need to do? We need to figure out how to prevent this from even happening. And when someone has been trafficked, we also have to protect that person rather than just focusing on punishing the trafficker. And we need all of these methods to really kind of combat trafficking as a whole. In recent times, partnership is the newest term that people talk about because they realize that uh, trafficking does span so many different industries and different age groups, gender, et cetera, et cetera, that it really requires a lot of uh, interagency coordination. And that is something that a lot of people maybe were not as used to. So a lot of partnership uh, between agencies, but also between countries in really aggressive position. In the U.S., there are many trafficking laws. Um, I'm not going to go through all of them, and we'll break a few down. Mostly, this is when I'm looking at a case. It looks very complicated. Um, but for adult sexual labor, minor labor cases, minor labor cases do have a higher legal standard. Um, we're looking: is someone being recruited or harbored or moved through the use of force or fraud or coercion? For the purposes of debt bondage and voluntary servitude, slavery, peonage, which is also needing to work for a debt for commercial sex acts. And we kind of go through kind of this process to see under the US law some of this, this, this definition. So I mentioned earlier, uh, I'm not going to go through Pong's story. This is something I mentioned earlier about Central American youth and Mexican youth being used by the drug cartels to um, transport drugs. And even though the essential act of transporting or selling drugs, just like the inherent act of being involved in some type of commercial sex act, is inherently illegal, if someone is pressing you into servitude and saying, you have to do this or I'm going to kill you, or you have to do this or something really bad is going to happen to your family, that is no longer uh, free uh, that you're doing this for a particular position. However, under the Trans <coughs> Victims Protection Act, Unfortunately, here in California, they do recognize and make exceptions for minors who are involved in commercial sex act. So you see the standards a little bit lower here. So anyone who's basically a minor who is involved in any kind of commercial sex act, that is, you are exchanging some type of sexual act um, for what we in the legal terms call consideration. So it's not just money, it could be food, shelter, drugs, clothing. Uh, 
uh, that is considered, that person is considered happy in survivor. And this is very complicated because sometimes we often consider minors who are involved in this, but they're still just doing something illegal or they're terrible, blah, blah, blah. And we're not really looking at it from the lens of the fact that they need support. Technically, under the law, they're considered a victim of a secret form of trafficking. So, under the federal laws, there are many, many different laws. And even there, though, uh, if you see the news, I want you to pay attention to the fact that sometimes there are certain trafficking cases that are not always prosecuted as under the most severe forms of crimes of trafficking, but maybe under things such as alien smuggling and harboring. Um, and that these cases, that the crime that people are convicted of may or may not rely actually the truth of what's happened. And the truth of the matter is the, the vast majority of our cases are not prosecuted. And that's because the burden of proof in criminal cases is very high. And especially in trafficking cases, oftentimes what's happening to the survivor is done in such secret that it's very difficult to have any evidence. Your only evidence in that case is the survivor who may be suffering from other forms of trauma, uh, may be difficult for them to testify, or maybe the community who comprises the jury may not really understand you know, the mental um, situation in which this person entered the situation. Let's talk a bit about the... Oh. So, in California there are a few laws. AB 22 was passed in 2005, and SB 1569 that really allows us to be able to trigger benefits. However, for the purposes of immigration work, which involves an immigrant, usually we're looking at federal laws for the immigration process, um, but maybe some of the prosecution might be happening under state laws. So every state has different laws, but California's laws were designed to be very broad-based, um, rather than focusing on one type of trafficking, and really also building provisions to protect the survivors. Under California law, you can also sue uh, your traffickers, which is quite incredible. And I think a lot of people are among some of the first states that pass such a comprehensive law as this. And it's something that I do recommend that people uh, look at. So there's a lot of confusion also between what trafficking is and what smuggling is, what prostitution is. I've touched upon this a little bit already, but mostly trafficking is a rights violation. Prostitution, generally in the state code, is a vice law of violation. And smuggling is a border violation. And these things can happen concurrently or sometimes not at all. A trafficking survivor who flies on a legitimate visa but then is subsequently trafficked uh, may be into labor, then that's just that top little bit diagram of lots of trafficking. But maybe someone was smuggled into the country then subsequently trafficked, um, but also into prostitution and would be in that little, little intersection. So these circles can go on and on and on. The difference is trafficking as a crime that recognizes the person who's being trafficked as a victim. But someone who is involved in prostitution or uh, is being smuggled, they are treated like, like criminals. So oftentimes this is the reason why we see many trafficking cases where people are not necessarily identified as victims um, because they are being seen as perpetrators of the law or breaking the law instead. In a lot of our cases, too, we see a lot of intersections of domestic violence and sexual assault. And this is something I want you to keep in mind. Um, when you see these cases, they're not or 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 cases. It's not that it's a trafficking case or a child abuse case or a sexual assault case. So in Sam's case, for example, is it also a child abuse case? Yes. It's not a trafficking case or a child abuse case. It's both. And so as we think about other things that we're more familiar with, such as these concepts of domestic violence and sexual assault, it's important to know that someone can experience multiple of these issues in a trafficking case. Um, recruitment. Usually people are recruited, the internet gets a lot of play these days, but usually it's in relation to sex trafficking cases. But recruitment we usually see through friends, family, um, the internet, though in cell phone, like text messages are making this very easy these days for people to get in touch with others. Um, usually, 
today can only explain to us, these were the things that I wanted to do that I couldn't do, or this is the thing that made me help with. And that kind of goes into what we're looking at, it's not the case, at the root of it, is usually a situation where someone is asserting power and control over someone else through various types of means. So it could be through um, coercion and threats to hurt someone's family. It could be emotional abuse. It could be isolating someone and locking them up in a trailer where the closest town is 10 miles away. It could be um, minimizing someone saying, if you don't continue to work for me, I know exactly, I know your mom, I know she has a lot of medical health problems. I'm just not going to send the money home for her health care like we promised. And you know, if, if that happens and she dies, it's your fault. Different forms of abuse to keep people into a certain situation. Other questions I usually frequently ask when clients when I meet them is where do you sleep at night? What kind of food were you being given? You will be shocked to hear um, I had a case involving someone who was 65 years old, her father, who had her clean houses, and would give her a can of beans that she would have to eat for the people the entire week. Um, terribly unnutritious food. Sleeping, I have several cases where people had to sleep in the closet of the spare room for no reason other than the fact that um, that's the attitude that someone wants to treat you. Like, you are some sort of, you are not as good as me. It's to break someone's will down in the situation. So those are the questions that we tend to ask for when we're screening for these cases. There, this is a whole list of barriers. This is an endless list of barriers. We ask, if someone is being trafficked, why don't they just run away, or why don't they just call the cops, or why don't they leave? There are so many reasons. Um, someone could be isolated. They have no idea how to speak the language. They may have been told, or they may have actually seen someone get arrested or deported, just like their traffickers warned them. They could actually have complex feelings related to the trafficker, especially if this person is their boyfriend or is a family member. Um, they could have a personal commitment of paying off the debt. The U.S. is one of the few countries in the world where if you're in debt, someone's not going to come throw you in, in jail for that. Um, I had a case where someone told me, I, I asked them, I was like, well, how do people collect debt in your country? You seem really worried about this existing debt. Um, and he said, oh, yeah, well, you know, they come around my village with a machete. That's how they collect the debt. So a lot of different issues that make people scared uh, to speak up. And they, most of the time they don't know what their rights are, that they deserve or can get help. Okay, terminology. Like I mentioned earlier, a lot of people don't know these terms that well. So oftentimes people make the mistake and say, could you leave a situation? It's like, well, yes, I could physically leave. Sometimes maybe the front door wasn't locked. But maybe the problem was that the trafficker never gave me a key to the apartment to come and go. And they also told me, that if I left the apartment, the immigration authorities would come around, find me, catch me, and deport me. So, a lot of these terms can be very confusing. There are a lot of services that are needed for our clients. Um, it is, includes immediate service assistance. So people tend to think, okay, we're helping trafficking survivors. Let's just bust in and we're gonna free, free the slaves and free everyone. And everyone's going to be happy and cure and just go back and be any problems. Again, it doesn't work like that. It's not that simple. Other than the immediate services of do you have medical concerns? Do you need a place to stay? What do we do in this case like that? Some of them um, suffer intense post traumatic stress disorder or other types of uh, abuse and need a lot of counseling and therapy. And oftentimes, when someone has been suffering from a lot of trauma, they may not be able to uh, remember things well. They may not be able to uh, recount exactly what happened or takes them time. And they may have feelings of shame. Sometimes some of our clients, in order to cope with that shame, or sometimes the doctors also um, make our clients addicted to substance abuse issues. And those cases are very complicated as well. Income assistance. Okay, well, now people want our clients to stick around for the next six months, one year, to testify for a criminal case. Okay, well, where is this person living? How are they, they still have the same problems of why they're usually here, which is that they need to support themselves or send money home to their families. Um, they need a place to live. For our male clients, this can be very difficult because there are often not a lot of shelter options for them other than homeless shelters. Um, and then legal assistance. So the problem is that you're here and you don't have legal status. Maybe you're out of the trafficking situation, but you may still not have status, which means that you don't qualify for benefits. You don't qualify for work for many years. Um, that you probably will just be re very easily again. Um, sometimes you're, what if you share a child with your doctor? Under family law, um, we have to do things 
make sure that this person has custody of your child. So lots of things can happen in one case that can be really stressful for one survivor. So we talk about empowering strategies. Um, how do we support our clients rather than using repressive strategies to deal with these issues? And repressive being usually kind of only focusing oftentimes on punishing the traffickers and punishing the wrongdoers um, and assuming that our clients' rights and the victims' rights and what they need are secondary. And we kind of want to talk about empowering strategies that are aimed at working with our clients to eliminate these root causes of why they're trafficked to begin with. So I want us to keep that in mind when we talk about um, the fact that oftentimes when we work with clients um, who have been trafficked, a lot of them exhibit a lot of behavioral ramifications, and we don't always understand. I, I, I've worked on cases where people have said, I just rescued this person, why isn't she just grateful, and why does she continue to make all these bad decisions? Um, some of it can be related to trauma, some of it can be related to the fact that people come from different background, backgrounds from different concerns. But the truth of the matter is, uh, people's lives are complicated, these things can happen, and we do, when we're working, we have to be able to let them make their own decisions and their mistakes sometimes. So we're not here to say the rest of you and check out people's lives in that sense. Okay. There are many legal proceedings, I'm not going to go through all of them in detail, and I've mentioned some of them. But this just gives you a sense of how complicated one case can be. So one trafficking survivor, let's say it's a minor who's been arrested for being forced to sell drugs. Um, the criminal justice process is usually to punish the abuser, usually the victim is there as a witness. In these drug deal cases, typically sometimes our clients are actually going to are prosecuted because they don't know that they are actually victims. Usually we work to um, legalize the clients so they can not only stay here but also get status. Um, so to prevent deportation and to get work authorization. Um, and the importance of immigration status is very important to prevent re-exploitation of a case. Um, Civil litigation. Some of our clients, even sometimes when there is no criminal case, maybe the fact of the matter is the client did work for somebody for many years and they deserve to get the pay. Um, they still have someone to support and maybe they need that. Um, I've had many, several cases where clients have worked for the traffickers for, for 19 years. It's a large chunk of their life to not be paid um, any money. So civil litigation would be also very helpful and appropriate for that. Family court, I mentioned earlier the child custody example. Uh, but also if you're juvenile dependency court and juvenile court issues as well. <clears throat> so when we're looking at trafficking survivors, some of the questions we ask in intake is we conduct the intake, we ask for possible forms of relief, and we assess for safety, the, the services and we do safety planning. When we do the intake, uh, sometimes our clients again have suffered a lot of trauma in the past and they have other concerns that we need to vet, to vet for. And then we ask the survivor, what do you want? From a service provider's perspective, this is really important. Because we're not mandating them on our end. You have to stay and testify. You have to stay to do X, Y, Z. You have to do X, Y, Z. We ask them, do you even want to stay here in the United States? And then we help them set up kind of uh, working with law enforcement, doing the legal and social services. If they do want to leave the U.S., sometimes we help initiate repatriation abroad. And this can be very tri tricky because some of us um, may or may not have good NGO partners in other countries to repatriate someone. And so the goal you hope is that you're repatriating someone to safety but not into a situation where they're going to be retracted again, but which is completely possible sometimes. So let's talk a bit about how we have told you what's happening. Uh, that it's a problem, that all these things are happening, the way that we as service providers do the work, what can the average person do on this, or as a student, or someone who's interested in being involved? Uh, changing cultural attitudes, uh, identifying what it looks like, educating other people, uh, sometimes just talking to that person who you can, I think you're, some, some spidey sense is telling you this person is not in a good place. Maybe. Maybe it's your role that day to just say like, hey, how are you doing? Are you okay? Give them our call, say like, oh, you know, you have rights in this country. It's a really basic conversation. You can volunteer at certain agencies. Um, we can go over some of these. Jeez. So this sounds 
really basic, but it's true. Usually the number one thing that people can do is to do a cultural attitude change. And that, I think that change begins with you. So when we talk about trafficking or domestic violence or these issues, one of the first things we need to do is change our language and change our attitudes and work with our community. So when we're going around, are we saying things like, well, that person had it coming to her. She would leave her husband. Like, I did not feel sorry for her. Are we still engaging in that victim blame? Or are we thinking, gee, I wonder why what's compelling this person to go back to the situation? And what can I do to support them? Um, same thing, anti-immigrant sentiments. We hear a lot of this all the time. Um, that is part of a cultural change, I think, that we can be a part of it in this dialogue. Um, working with trafficking survivors do, does require suspending a lot of judgment. Oftentimes it's very easy to think about what you would have done in a situation compared to someone else, but also not considering the fact that everyone comes from a different place, has a different background, and has a different situation and attitude to these things. So usually I ask you to systematically check and challenge your own assumptions, your own biases, and your own prejudices to know that most of us have been very privileged in a situation where we've been able to enjoy a lot of freedoms that I think a lot of uh, people who have been trafficked have not. So I think kind of coming from that cultural change as well. Being our eyes and ears, um, obviously if you see something fishy, uh, always feel free to refer them to a service agency for support, to uh, in an emergency situation, obviously contacting law enforcement. Um, do avoid direct confrontational, confrontational personal rescue missions. These cases can be really intense and scary, even I'm scared of them oftentimes. Feel free to call us here at the National Human Trafficking Hotline. Um, and the Freedom Network USA.org is a national coalition that we are part of that works with many agencies like us on a nationwide basis, and this is a case in another state. So when you're also thinking about this, think about what are your strengths, what are your interests, and how would you like to engage in this work? Um, a lot of academic research is something that people are not thinking about. But also think about direct services, um, volunteering at shelters. Many of the, our partners who support trafficking survivors, for example, the Asian Women's Shelter, or actually domestic violence shelters, in which there are 40 to 60 hour training programs where you can become uh, a language advocate or an advocate um, who has the caseworker privilege, uh, the, sorry, the domestic violence or human trafficking caseworker privilege. You can even do things like assisting nonprofits like ours on basic things like technology and design, I mean, many of our nonprofits are not very sophisticated in these issues. Um, you can express yourself through music, culture, and art as part of that cultural change. And you can encourage first responders, so besides us as direct service providers, what about law enforcement, medical professionals, to think about trafficking as another issue uh, that they should be screened and identifying. When someone brings a policy issue to you and says, here, support this law, some advice I would give is, Think about how do the policy concerns affect trafficking survivors. Um, sometimes the law might not have the word trafficking in it, but the impact on trafficking survivors can be very great. So as I mentioned earlier, for example, many of those who support trafficking survivors actually work with a lot of domestic violence survivors, and that's where a lot of the funding comes from. So when the funding cuts come through some of these services, it's actually affecting our work and supporting trafficking survivors. Other things is, are, does the law only talk about prosecuting people and where are the portions of, where, is there anything in the law that talks about protecting and supporting survivors? Uh, that's something that I think that's very important when you're thinking about passing comprehensive laws. So I'm just finally going to give you some outreach examples. Uh, people oftentimes think that the flashy poster of someone locked up behind bars is the thing that's going to speak to people. Here are some examples of stuff that I think are Helpful. This is a cartoon that someone's done to explain the part of law. Not quite trafficking that we hand out to the community. Um, most people don't want to, you know, be receiving graphic, uh, outreach materials that kind of make them identify <coughs> something that they would want to be associated with. A classic example is I've seen a lot of flyers of um, outreach pamphlets of women dressed in very skimpy clothing. That's not very appealing to necessarily pick up for actually the survivor itself or certain communities. This is an example, um, also another cartoon that they did on farm work. This was put up by one of our partner agencies in Seattle and Texas as well. Something that I think that they've been distributing to the farm workers. And this is to account for the fact that some of our 
our clients are also maybe illiterate, or in a lot of the farm workers that we work with actually come from indigenous populations in which maybe um, they don't even necessarily speak Spanish, but I think you kind of get a sense of what's happening here. My shelter ads that we've done before are in various languages. Uh, sometimes language is a big barrier, so thinking about that. But kind of the images, maybe not so much the spoon with the hands type, because usually most of our clients are not in a situation like that. I don't know if you can see that well, but in that particular bus shelter um, uh, poster, there's a person who's washing dishes, kind of on a restaurant, a man, a woman who's at a sewing machine, another woman who's sweeping the floor. So kind of giving you a broad sense of what trafficking might look like. This was developed by our partners in Seattle, uh, related to things that they would hide in free um, sanitary napkins, and actually has that they would give out to people. So different ideas of how to kind of slide sneaky information to people who might be in a situation where they don't want to be carrying a lot of pamphlet. Posters that were developing at Stanford um, Law School's International Human Rights Clinic on uh, giving a poster to educate doctors. So lots of examples here. And the Fair Food Fund, this in Florida, there is this great campaign that they started to um, educate people in Taco Bell about how a lot of the tomatoes that they used in their food were being grown cultivated by people who have been trafficking for some terrible working situations. So getting Taco Bell's and the corporate agencies to kind of also be involved in their supply chain of where they're sourcing their food, in which they turned into a museum um, that is based off of um, They turned that truck actually where they used to lock up many of the tomato growers who have been forced into uh, this kind of work in Florida into a museum, a traveling museum, for people to see what happened in the case and the conditions of people living under. So finally, there are just a few, we just a few, and, oh, um, and one of our partners who has converted some of the early history of women who were trafficked actually, uh, who were Chinese American, into hands as well, and educated people through that way. So as you can see, people have become very creative about ways to spread the word about trafficking. Um, there's also South Bay Coalition in our partners. This is my contact information. Feel free to contact me at the time. Um,